Welcome back to another live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest in today. He is the leader of the Alberta Party here in the province of Alberta, Barry Morishita. Barry, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure, as always. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for the invitation. Always appreciate conversation with you. No, I always appreciate you ha- having you on and having just an in-depth conversation about the issues that are facing Albertans and uh, people across this great province. But first, I want to take a moment and mention that we are recording this on June 21st, which is National Indigenous Peoples Day here in Canada. Barry, as the leader of a federal party, I can imagine that this day means something special to you because we honor the people who have come before us and the original settlers of this uh great country of ours um do you have anything you want to say just on this special recognition of uh national indigenous people's day yeah thanks chris so it's really cool uh to be celebrating this day um and i you know come to you from treaty six territory here in in brooks and uh home of uh uh maybe indigenous cultures and peoples and um you know, uh, blessed to be able to be on the land here and blessed to be able to, to uh, have these conversations today in some of my social media. I said it's, it's really important that uh, Albertans, Canadians, we need to listen to what's going on in there. And the, the Alberta Party has been really um, thoughtful about that. We have a, a great uh, shadow minister of Indigenous relations. We have Indigenous board member and, you know, we have so much to learn. And I think the biggest thing is, is that uh, we should use this day to listen and understand. And then me- moving forward, we should trust that we can work uh, with Indigenous people in Alberta and, and, and do what's best for them. And that will be in turn be good for Alberta. So uh, I, I'm, I'm glad we do this. And it's really exciting to see that conversation continue on. Speaking of conversations, let's just stay in this area for a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, you have been crisscrossing this province. You have been meeting with people in Treaty 6, as you said, but we do have Treaty 7, Treaty 8 in this province. Um, what are the issues that you are hearing from Indigenous uh, uh uh, band members from chiefs from first nations communities across this great uh province of ours what are the issues that they are facing today well you know i i hear a lot of frustration actually chris the you know uh, the the 94 recommendations in the truth and reconciliation commission are great things to achieve for sure if we can achieve them but but i think to actually you know kind of really move on them we need to fundamentally shift uh, how we think about our, in, our indigenous relations. Now, the, the, we've always kind of talked about consultations and uh, those kinds of things, but really I think what we need to get to is uh, we need to trust that indigenous have the best interests of their people and the land, uh, uh, you know, is top of mind for them. And I think we have to trust them with that conversation to lay that out first, rather than coming back and consulting. So. You know, I, I hear frustration with everybody talks about trying to meet these 94 goals, and they are noble goals, don't get me wrong. If we were to achieve them all, we would be in great shape. But I think to make any real headway on them, we've got to shift how we do it. And I keep hearing that the first thing we need to do is listen, understand, and let them have the say about what goes on first. And I think we could move a lot quicker if, if we would uh, get into that uncomfortable area and and do that first that's that's what i keep hearing and and i hope uh the alberta party will would bring on policy that reflects that because that's certainly the direction i'd like to see us going in you have talked numerous times on this uh the show and uh, numerous interviews that i've listened to you about the alberta party's approach to government and being more of a listening government and not directing government which we're seeing the top-down approach Why is that so important in today's uh, age to have a government that listens to experts, that listens to Albertans? Why is that so important to the government? But why is that so important to you as well? Well, uh, you know, I think we're at a time when people distrust their politicians. And and with good good reason. You you look, there's lots of examples for people not to trust politicians. But I'm always saying... Uh, in my addresses to people, when's the last time that you felt politicians or the government trusted you to make decisions, to be part of your uh, service a system around you that the government's involved in, be it healthcare, education, social services, 
indigenous religion. When was the last time that the most affected groups of people were actually brought to the table in a meaningful way and, and we talk about their concerns? Uh, the disability community is another one. You know, where, where we have rules being made and legislation being built by able-bodied people, by people that don't have disabilities, by people who can't possibly have that perspective. And the only way we're going to be able to move forward with all the incredible resource that's available in every one of these communities is to engage them directly. So first, government has to trust them and say, hey, you're a health care provider. You tell me what's the best way to provide health care. Let's see what we can get to. And if we that that's so important to me, because in my life as a municipal politician, that's how you fix problems. You you talk to the most affected. You heard from the most affected. And then as a group, you got together and made a decision and people felt like they had the, were part of the process. And that's one of the biggest things missing in, in, in our society when it comes to governance right now is people don't feel heard. They don't feel they're part of the system, that the system overtakes them. And that's not how it should be. And that's not how it'll be if I'm, uh, I'm in charge. So how do you change that? Because you bring up a good point. Not only has the government stopped talking to the people, but the people in some sense have stopped talking to the politicians because they don't feel like they're being heard. Um, you, you, I was at the uh, nomination meeting and the uh, candidate selection meeting for Carrie Condell in uh, Calgary Elbow, and you made an announcement there which was very... Uh, shocking to me because I had never heard it come out of your mouth. And you said at that meeting, which we had taped and we we, we have yep. it on record, that the Alberta party, if elected, you will have no whipped votes. You will, right. the candidate that is elected will be required to talk to the uh, their constituents. That's a big deal in today's society where everything seems to be whipped. So why was it so important for you to say, you know what, we, we're going to change politics as it's done and go back to a more grassroots type of politics of yesteryear? Yeah. You know, well, well, there's two reasons. That's when we were most successful as a province. You know, when we were really, uh, when the government, I think, was really in tune with what was going on and looking, looking at the future and bringing those communities with them into that future was, you know, the early 70s when, when Peter Lougheed was running Alberta, to be quite honest. We transformed the government, we transformed the province. And the reason, the way we did it was we took people with us. People came with the government. And, uh, you know, uh, the, there doesn't need to be whipped votes. I mean, you know... When it comes right down to it, we've gotten so far the other way, I guess, uh, you know, so strict, you can't, you can't even breathe. You, every, every government MLA speaks from a white paper with briefing notes on it. They aren't allowed to deviate. You know, how do you get any innovation? How do you get any sense of what's going on in the community that way? Uh, that's completely lost. Um, under my leadership, I wouldn't. I want good candidates that reflect their community, love their community, know their community really well. And when we're discussing solutions that, uh, that are for the province that we will vote on as a provincial legislature but certainly we have to also then keep in mind that different areas and different communities are going to be affected different and then maybe we have to come to more thoughtful solutions chris so that you know this fits for 80 percent of their 30 percent of the people or 50 percent of the people um but maybe our solutions have to be more thoughtful maybe they're a little bit different and that's okay with me uh, I don't expect the same things to happen in every corner of the province of Alberta. So for us to have that reflected, we can't ram legislation through. So no whipped votes makes a lot of sense for me. If the, if, if the policy is so bad, quite frankly, and you heard me say it there, that I can't get my own caucus to vote for it, then maybe we need to have another look. And that's maybe going to lead to an improvement in the way we govern. So just to play a little bit of devil's advocate with that scenario here is if the Alberta party forms government, would you not then have a situation where you would need to try and pass bills like the budget, which is not always going to be great for the people of Camrose. It's going to benefit more people in uh, Brooks Medicine Hat or Lesser Slave Lake. So how do you balance not whipping votes against getting legislation passed? Because if you have 87 candidates, 87 MLAs, all wanting certain things, that's going to be a hard task to juggle are you up to that task of being able to bring people together and say okay we have to look at it as the best for the province and not always just the best for the riding 
yeah, no, Chris, I think you make a good point. And that's the conversation that has to happen. And I think that's why you have to have a more thoughtful approach to policy building, the rules and regulations you put in. Because if you don't, you're going to have exactly that situation where everybody's going to look at it single-mindedly for their own. Now, they should consider what's important for their uh, their constituents and, and how they're advantaged by or disadvantaged by a piece of legislation or rule for sure. But also they do have to govern for the province of Alberta. And again, this is me as a leader trusting my MLAs and trusting actually not even my MLAs, all the MLAs, to do the right job for Alberta. We've, we've created such a situation where, you know, that, that, that question that you ask, rather than being uh, a, a thoughtful question, becomes a rhetorical question in the government we have today because it doesn't matter how bad it is, they all vote for them. So it, it becomes rhetorical. But in my government, it wouldn't be. And I, yeah, you know what? I, do I expect the smoothest path there? Do I expect to be have huge bumps in the road? Absolutely. But we are not going to regain the trust of Albertans. We're not going to have better government unless we break the system down that's really squashing ideas and innovation and really taking people out of the game. You, I want to turn to uh, bigger issues. And the first one I want to start with is kind of a topic that you mentioned earlier on in your last statement, and that is rural issues. As, as a province, we typically think of urban issues, Calgary, Edmonton. We often forget about what's happening in rural Alberta. As the mayor of a rural, uh, former mayor of a rural community of Brooks, you know firsthand some of the issues that are facing rural Albertans. And the issues down in Brooks are not the same up in High Level or not the same down in uh, this, that, and the Jasper. So they're always different. But one of the issues that I am hearing from mayors of small rural communities is crime. Crime is always a big issue when it comes to uh, uh, rural communities because the resources are usually spread very uh, largely and there's not a lot there. I want to talk about the police force and okay. you were, you were not prepared for this question. So this is not a, I usually go into these interviews very uh, uh, green. So the province of Alberta is floating the idea of a provincial police force, getting rid of the RCMP and moving to a provincial police force. Now I have spoken to mayors in rural communities and they say, ah, we don't want that. We want to keep with our RCMP because we like our RCMP. We just wish they were better resourced. What does the Alberta Party stand on a provincial police force versus RCMP? And how do we better equip our police force to properly work in our communities, especially our rural communities? So those are that's a, that's a big that's a big question, Chris. But first of all, yeah, no, we're we're we want to keep the RCMP. And then there's a couple of reasons. You know, at the very top level, uh the, the cost uh, is 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 not worth it. We you know it's, it's just the transition as an estimate is 360 million to change. That alone, there's a lot of other things that are much more important on a priority level than changing police forces to start with. Second of all, um, the police model that's currently here in Alberta that's uh, that is a community policing model, particularly in rural Alberta, has made improvements over the last several years, and it will continue to improve if we continue to invest in it both uh, from a, a, you know, a, a kind of a partnering program, partnerships with municipalities, as well as making sure that it's properly resourced um, by everybody. So you, you have two components when it comes to rural policing. You have a provincial policing component, they pay for some. You have a federal component, you have a municipal component. And the, the, again, you, you said it very, very aptly. There's a lot of difference between the crime issues in different areas across the province. And we need to be more integrated in our approach about how to deal with those distinct issues of crime. So I met with some farmers and ranchers in southern Alberta here uh, several months ago. We talked about that. You know, what was, what was driving their rural crime? What was the problem and how do we, how do we tackle it? You know, first of all, they, they accept that they have longer call times. You know, they're, they don't need it. They don't, they don't expect a detachment to be at the front kind of driveway of their farmyard. But at the same time, the underlying issues that are causing crime, they'd like to see some different opportunities. So, you know, we talked about things like intervention for issues because they're, you know, whether they're drug addictions, whether there's homelessness, whether there's other poverty issues, sometimes it's mental health. 
our system does not work very well to deal with that on a proactive basis. So even if the RCMP could be there lickety split and pick that person up, uh, the justice system doesn't really deal well with first offense, doesn't really deal, deal well with, with that type of opportunity crime. In fact, some have told me that it's worse when they go into jail because when they get out, they're better at what they do or worse at the, what they do, is however you want to put that. So they even talked about things like better, better, you know, better electronic surveillance. Are there tools out there that can, that can look after those rural areas, make them safer? Because safety is the big issue. And then the other thing was, you know, do there have to be mandatory treatment programs? Do you have to, uh, you know, do you have to provide mental health support? So you hopefully keep people out of the system. You know, there's a, there's a multitude of things that are feeding that. And to just say that it's going to be better by changing the police force is a complete fairy tale. The fact is, is that every community has some problems. Uh, they have different issues. They need to attack them, but they need some autonomy to do so. And they need some authority to do so, I think. So you need to drive resources into local communities. Um, if you have, uh, you know, we have, an, uh, we have a large immigrant community in the city of Brooks. Language is a language barriers, fear of uh, authority is a huge issue for a, a lot of people. We need different resources to deal with that. Um, you know, uh, in some other area that maybe it's uh, maybe it's all, uh, you know, oil field crime. I don't know, but uh, we trust communities to be able to work those solutions with the current system. We're all going the right direction. We're trying to reintegrate how first response looks. The RCMP recognizes that if they had a m more mental health supports for first response, they might have better outcomes. So, you know, there's no simplistic solution. Taking control of it by having an Alberta police uh, force, I don't think really does lend us to go there any faster. And the misnomer that, you know, somehow the Ottawa, Ottawa controls the RCMP. The fact is, is that K Division is, is answerable to the justice minister here in Alberta. They're answerable to their uh, municipal contracts here in Alberta, so it is. It, that's where the that's where the operation hits the road, and uh, we can still improve that without changing uh, and costing a lot of money and disruption. Now, you you know it probably better than I do that this year the municipalities across this great province are going to be uh, faced with a bit of a challenge because. The federal government has given a raise to the RCMP, which is going to be on the back of municipalities. Now, we, budget is usually February, March. Usually it's supposed to be in December for municipalities, but sometimes they have the tendency to push them a little bit later just to make sure they dot their I's and wait for the provincial government to come out. Um, yep. If elected, how would you ensure that the, pro the, the cities aren't getting downloaded upon because they're already struggling right now with the rise of costs going through the roof across this province. And now they're going to have the RCMP bill that they're going to have to pick up as well, which is going to have to be passed on to the Alberta taxpayers. Yeah. So, so first of all, I mean, first of all, on, on the, strictly on the RCMP raise, I think there's, uh, because there's retroactive play on the go forward, I don't, I don't think you can avoid it. That's the cost. That's the cost of the service. That's fair. But on the retroactive part, I think the federal government actually has to be picking up the tab here. Uh, you know, municipalities weren't engaged, weren't involved in the negotiations. They didn't set the terms. Uh, the terms were set for us. And again, by another level of government imposed on us without really any consultation. And, uh, you know, I think from that perspective, if I was, I would be pressing the federal government very hard to, to take that stand. I know that's happening at the municipal level. And it should be happening with the province to be walking hand in hand with them to do that. Uh, that being said, you know, if uh, if the feds didn't come through with the entire share or a portion of it, we would sit down with the municipalities and have to work that out. Because I know as a municipal politicians, it's almost impossible with, you know, balancing budgets and keeping things to go back five years and then try to make up for that, uh, for those lost costs. And, you know, I think we'd have to be responsible about it, but we'd also have to be fair. So. First approach is I think Ottawa should be paying for it uh, the, and then going forward if that's not ex all covered then I think uh, it would be uh, I'd be more than happy to sit down with the municipalities and work something out and go forward. Um, you, I wanna, the next line of questioning is a similar topic you mentioned a little bit uh, beforehand it's about our justice system. 
um, especially in rural areas. And this, as you can tell, I'm kind of in the rural air mindset right now because next week I'm going to be sitting down with some rural mayors and talking to them about their issues that are facing them. And what I hear over and over again from uh, rural communities and uh, uh, politicians in the rural uh, atmosphere here in the provinces, a criminal goes into the justice system, they get a slap on the hand and they're released. And like you said, they go to jail, they find out how to do it better so they're not in jail next time. Is there reforms that we need to be putting into place and looking into around our justice system? Because if we have just a perpetual rotating door here of criminals in, criminals out, and re repeat offenders over and over again, is it really keeping our community safe? But is it also ensuring that our justice system is protecting the people who it's supposed to protect and not just letting uh, criminals back on the street? Yeah, no, I... I, I... I think uh, that, that that is exactly how we have to deal with it in terms of that there are some problems in the justice system because we have, you know, it, it's uh, you sentence them, they get out, they go. Um, there's not really a lot of opportunity to change. You don't look at those underlying things. And I, I think when you look at, um, um, and I don't know the statistics directly, but I know a lot of even the rural crime and crime in general, but rural crime is driven from socioeconomic problems. Not all of it. Let's face facts. There's some bad people out there and, and our system should deal harshly with people that are that are just bad, you know, aren't aren't don't have a track to get to contribute to society. There should be uh, better ways of dealing with this. But for these ones that are kind of brought in and then go back out and steal another truck or, or steal the gas or whatever they're doing, you know, property stuff and all that, there's got to be another way to deal with with people that have trouble, that have mental health issues, that have addiction issues, uh, have poverty issues, there's got to be a better way of dealing with that. And um, again, I, I, I don't have all of the answers. I just know that our approach isn't working. So it seems to me uh, that, you know, being on this planet for more than 50 years and, and being in a governance role that you know, you, you, you should learn, and we practically learn quickly, that if you stay doing the same thing over and over again and then expect, you know, a different result, that's, I think they, they refer to that as insanity or madness, and that's where we are. And you know what? We don't have to change the whole world to do it. We could pilot some things in some areas, you know. Maybe we have a bad, an area where we could pilot a program or try something different, but I know that nothing will get better if we keep using the same stuff we have, the same tools we have now. We've got to use, uh, we've got to use new ones. We've got to try new ones, and uh, you know we'll be in a big, we'll be in a lot more trouble in ten years if we don't. So I'd like to see us try some new, innovative ways. I, I listen to people who speak about the issue, and and I listen, uh, listen and read about a jurisdiction that has some success and. You know, the fact is, is that success isn't measured in 100%. Because if it was, I would have never graduated school, Chris, I can tell you that. But I got through, and uh, I was able to move on. And I think that's what we have to look at. If we can save a few people from being back in that system, from breaking into that farmyard, then we've had some success. But I think the only way we do it is we have to try some new things. We have to be, be willing to try some new new methodology, that's for sure. Um moving away from rural issues but still staying on it in some sense because this next topic is an issue that faces not just people here in calgary but across the province and around canada right now and that's inflation inflation is on the top of everyone's mind right now and we are seeing semi good uh oil prices which is good for our budget but it doesn't translate into passing the buck off to uh average Joe on the street or average Jane on the street. Um, can the province be, is, should the province be doing more to address the issue around inflation when it comes to our resources, our uh, price of gas? I know it's a federal issue, but we, this is not just a federal issue. This is a municipal issue. This is a provincial issue. This is an everyone hands on deck issue. Can the province be? Can the province do more to address this issue around inflation on everyone's pocketbook right now? Yeah, yeah, I think there are. I, I, I think we have to be. You know, we we can't do everything. I don't. I don't think uh, there's a solution in handing out you know big checks to people because we have a surplus, but. You know, there's also the opportunity to, for the Alberta Party's policy is that, you know, uh, 
current generation should be benefiting some from resource revenue, but that we have to also be mindful that the future generations are also benefiting from it. So there's got to be a balance. So, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to provide breaks there. But I think there's a couple of fundamental things. I think, you know, when we look at insurance, for one, uh, you know, we've, uh, we, we only have to look to our neighbor to the east of us to see a government run insurance company that has, uh, and I've seen the invoices, uh, spectacularly better rates for uh, vehicle insurance than we do in Alberta. Um, and I, I know Scott Moe isn't a communist or a socialist, uh, but he runs a damn good insurance program by all accounts. And, when, and if we, you know, you think about the impactful things we could do. So right now we're looking at that option as a party. I think it's, I, I think it's a no brainer. Uh, but when you can chop your insurance bill from $3,000 to 1500 or from 1500 to 800 it seems to me that that would take a significant chunk of that inflationary pressure off your paycheck. And uh, we have a system that already works. We're not very far to go look for it. So something like that, I think, is important. I think, And it shouldn't only be when inflation is high, Chris. We should be looking for these things all the time, how to do things better. But that's one. The other thing is on, you know, I don't understand all of the distribution pieces of the electricity and all of that but you know we've we've we're looking into that type of uh you know is there some again is there some uh systemic things in there that are causing us uh problems that we shouldn't um that we should be able to feed back and i think the other thing is that overall we have to be prepared after uh you know going through what we've gone through uh, that you you do have to pay a little bit of the price when you know the economy heats up. So I'm I'm not an economist, and I know slow and steady is the way to go. But sometimes you know you can't control the world price of oil. Uh, it seems to be its own thing. So sometimes you know you have to be uh, prepared to live with that because you do get a benefit and a downside. So if we f focus on the fundamental things, the things that we have to deal with every day. Then maybe we'll have a better better track record. So things that are day to day for us, I think we have to look at as a group. And you know, we're currently considering how that insurance thing could work, and possibly something in the electrical and natural gas distribution side uh, to see if there's some opportunities for longer term relief for Alberta. Uh I should mention that uh, Carrie Kendall was on the show last week. She We did a live interview with her last Tuesday. And she mentioned that you guys are having a policy convention here in the future. So uh, these ideas are going to be fleshed out, which I'm assuming will be part of the platform that is going to be presented to the Alberta public in before the next election or during the next election, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And there's actually, so we have the policy convention going on uh, in October and then also, as you'll, you'll start to see out roll out really quickly, some more uh, broader engagement with Albertans through some citizen-led democracy uh, exercises on all kinds of issues. And, and that'll be an opportunity for Albertans to be part of the conversation so that we can hear what they're saying, hear what the important issues are, and, and whether we're going in the right direction or give us some new ideas to go in a different direction. Uh, we're open to that as well. So we had a lot going on over the summer and into the fall. Um, uh, turning back to some of the issues, and I, I want to talk about one that is affecting a lot of people, it's similar to the lines of inflation, but the housing market. A lot of people, my generation and younger, and I say that I say that as a 37-year-old man now, and I can't believe I'm saying my generation, but here we are. I feel like a, my grandfather when I said that, um, are being left out in the cold they can't find a house they can't afford a house uh, uh salaries aren't going up but housing is um we need to fix this and this is an issue that is the provincial led and this isn't an issue just here in calgary it's across the province i know we have some policies that you're probably working on but is this an issue that you pledge to address if uh, elected yeah and i think again you have to you have to have a thoughtful approach first of all you've got to forge the proper relationship so you know the the federal government's involved to some degree uh the municipalities see it on the ground um uh but the province has to be on board and so we we have to look at what that approach should be what that partnership should be certainly there's there's a you know a, a good case that there's not just not enough inventory and that's what driving a lot of costs up uh certainly that certainly there are some some regional overheated markets just because of the desirability, I guess, 
And I'm honestly, Chris, I'm not sure what you do about some of those areas. I, because if the desire to live in an area is so, so hyped up, so much higher, um, you know, I, I have to, I'm not sure exactly how that works. Although the, the danger is, is that then you, you know, you kind of take out an entire segment of a society when they can't afford to live in an area. So I think affordable housing certainly has to be on the radar, but it has to be, we have to come up with some sustainable models for it. Um, can't, um, and I don't know exactly what that looks like. I was at a affordable housing AGM here in Brooks actually just yesterday. And one of the problems is, is that the province sets arbitrary rules for how long, you, you know, there's all kinds of these things that get in the way and we, we've got to have a better approach. Uh, I think there's a lot of resource at the community level to do some things. If they could count on a steady model, something that could work in their community, but you can't take the Calgary affordable housing model and plant it in Brooks. It, it won't work, right? We, you know, we, we, we don't have hotels to retrofit. We don't have, that's not what works here. Um, but at the same time, we also have to come up with, uh, to deal with these problems in the inner city areas. Again, those are different. And there's no doubt about it. It's going to take a sustained resource. Um, but I think we have to, uh, again, talk to people who are on the ground saying, what do we need to do? You know, what is that? What is the barrier? Is the barrier that you can't come up with a down payment or is the barrier the price? Okay, if the barrier is universally the price, then what can we do? Uh, you know, I and I don't know the, 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 the details of that solution. But right now, we kind of just throw out, well, we're going to make everybody have, we're going to have affordable housing. Well, I don't think it's that simple, first of all. And uh, I think it's different in every market, but I think we have to identify what those problems are. We have a great corporate partner here in the city of Brooks that's uh, actually loaning money out of a fund to help people get into their house down payment and paying it back over time. You know, there's, and, and that was a nightmare regulatorily for them to do. So maybe there's lots of opportunities and maybe the regulations in the way, I don't know. Uh, I, I think there's ways to do it, but uh, again, we've got to open up the toolbox and try some new stuff. Which, and then on the flip side of that, and this is just me being a homeowner and, I, 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 I hate to say this, but I'm happy when my house price goes up because if I go to resell, I'm going to get more than I bought it for, right? So there are people in this world who are going, I understand that it's it's hard to get a house right now, but I kind of like that my house price has doubled since I bought it. So that way when I go sell it, which is not going to be beneficial when I go buy a new house, but you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean. So it's... Yeah, no, no and, and, that's, and I think that's where you really have to get down, Chris, and identify the problem for people, like whether... You know, is it, it, there's, there's just so many fundamental different things that are, that are uh, at issue. Uh, and then again, we just always try to kind of nail one thing down. We're only, well, we're going to do this and this is going to fix affordable housing. You know what? Not really there. You know, I've read half a dozen articles. One where say we have too much rental. One where say we have uh, too much concentration of foreign ownership. One where it says we have too many people speculating on homes where, you know, there's a whole bunch of things somewhere we don't have enough inventory. But yet there's some markets that aren't like that. So I, you know, I don't think it's a one thing, but I, again, you partner, you get communities to be involved so that they can fix the problem they have, or at least attempt to fix the problem they have. Uh, quit wasting time with the words, uh, just saying, hey, let's fix your problem. How do we do it? What do you need from us? Uh, and let's try and go forward. Is this so a the province? Doing it is more Sorry, is this a province that a one size fits all doesn't work? Because it seems like we've had government after government who has tried to look at it as it's an Alberta issue. And it sounds like, and you're right, the issues of uh, affordable housing here in Calgary are not going to be the same out in Brooks, are not going to be the same up in Hannah, are not going to be the same up in Stettler. Uh, so do you need to look take Alberta out of the equation and look at it as more of a uh, entities within the province that we have to try and find a solution for and not just a one size fits all. Yeah, I, I think so. I, you know, housing is an issue across the board. It's maybe a really high priority in Calgary and a low priority in uh, Entwistle or Hannah. I don't know. But, but again, we're, we, we, we can't give the same solution. And the only way to do that is to trust the people that are delivering for you. And, too often the government wants to control all the marbles on the floor. They want to control everything. They want to have a say in everything. And so they can't have 87 solutions if there were 87 riding solutions either. 
You know, we have 87 MLAs. Nobody said they all had to be the same, think the same, do the same, although there are a couple parties that would like that. But, you know, we, we just aren't there. And uh, recognizing that there are differences is the first kind of step on our way to a better future, I think. Um, and every, every other issue's like that. Everybody wants to get through school, right? So everybody wants to graduate grade 12. I don't think anybody starts school saying I don't want to. But getting through school in some jurisdictions is different. Kids yeah. are different. Um, it, the sooner we allow people to help people and to guide people that need different, different resources, different uh, aids, different approaches, the better off we'll be. But if we just keep trying to funnel them through one system, we're going to leave a lot of people behind. One last area of discussion I want to talk about before we turn into one of the weirder conversations I thought I would never have with a, a, a provincial political leader, but we are in 2022 and there's a little UCP leadership <laughs> race. And that is health care. I want to talk about health care and then we'll talk about another issue here. Uh, last Monday, the province announced that we're moving into stage three. I think it was actually last weekend, last Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. We're moving into stage three, so masks are no longer needed in public transit. Masks are no longer needed at hospitals. Only required at long-term care centers. Uh, this was sent out by a news release. There was no press conference around it, and everyone went, oh, what just happened here? We're now in a new uh, world, and no one's really given us any time or uh, thought process on how we can move this uh, safely. Was this too soon or was this the right pace? Because we're seeing numbers semi-stable, hospitalizations are going down. What's your thoughts on what the province announced last week? So, so two things, just on the general management of it. Again, you know, you kind of said something very, very telling there. You said, you know, with it said we weren't able to, we didn't understand, we weren't sure what to do. And that's exactly what the province should be doing. The government of Alberta should be informing you enough, Chris, to know what you're supposed to do. You should have understood what was going on before. And, and that's been a major flaw of the strategy. On the individual, you know, um, uh, the health mandates or the different rules and regulations, it's really difficult for me to comment on them specifically because I'm not privy to that information either. I don't know how they made that decision, let alone regular Albertans should know that. In fact, I think the reason, one of the reasons that early in when we had our COVID issue and we've talked about this before was that every bit of information I could get, every bit of information the staff of the city, we were passing on to people in Brooks so they knew as much as we did so that they were able to make choices and people stayed home and people avoided, you know, as much as they could. Were we perfect? Absolutely not, but most of us did a good job. And I think through COVID, uh, through the management that the province has done and the federal government too, to be quite honest, is they've kept enough away from us so that we do our own research and we've come up with all of these reasons why or why not we should do things. and. Uh, you know, I think that's where we are. I, I don't think you get out of that now. And uh, if we were well informed, I think we would make good choices. Uh, I know that if um, if I'm going to see my grandmother and I've been at a conference, uh, I'm probably going to be wearing a mask into that room until we're comfortable, right? Like, I don't want to get my grandmother sick um, because I, I think that's what I know. But again, when you just release it quietly. You don't explain what we expect of Albertans to do. Um, uh, that's where we are. We're all a little bit confused and not sure what to go on. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it was soon or later, I guess, in, you know, from my perspective, unfortunately, I can't tell you too much about whether it was the right choice at the right time. All I know is that we we're all ill-informed about it and that's too bad. Well, and just on that note, I, I, I'm a political observer. I watch these things and if I don't know what's happening and if the former mayor of a city doesn't know what's happening, maybe it's time for someone to get in front of a camera and just have like a 20 minute press conference. And I hate yeah. it. Sounds, sounds ridiculous sometimes, but just yeah. inform the people. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Inform us and trust us to make good choices. And most of us will. Exactly. 
Now, here's a conversation here I thought I would never have to have, but we're, we are in the midst of a leadership race for the UCP, and it seems like it's on everyone's mind and everyone's mouth, and that is autonomy from Ottawa. Autonomy, 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 and separation from Canada. Um, uh, leader, uh, leadership candidate Danielle Smith has come out with the Alberta Separation Act, which would say we won't follow any rules that are passed by the Supreme Court. What's your position on autonomy and separation, Alberta Party leader Barry Marchita? Okay, well, I, I think she called it the Sovereignty Act. I apologize. Um, yes, the Sovereignty yeah, Act. No, that's okay. I just I I, I don't want to don't want to be seen as painting someone separatist when they haven't said that. But to the to your point about autonomy and sovereignty and uh, you know. Quite honestly, just they're they're trying to win a leadership race, and and they're they're doing what they're doing to get to get that vote, I think. But on a practical point, is uh, Alberta should have never been in a position where where we where we seem to have to beg at the federal table, where we seem to be disrespected. Um, and I, you know, I think we have to own some of that. I think our leadership has to own some of that. Um, we made Alberta a pretty amazing place. Uh, in uh feder in the federation by working with our partners um do i agree with things that ottawa has done arbitrarily absolutely do not and i think we do have to stand up and deal with those things but we should deal with it from a position of strength and by that i mean we should have relations across this country with every provincial leader uh, we should be providing energy leadership across this country that does not just talk about extraction that talks about renewables, that talks about uh, technology, that talks about opportunities to, to have Canada have an energy future. I think we have to talk uh, from a position of leadership on all of those things so that our voice isn't discounted in Ottawa. It's discounted in Ottawa because uh, in my opinion, in the last, we just, we haven't, we haven't held up our bargain to be good uh, partners. And we've done that for political purposes. We haven't done that for practical purposes, you know. Do we, but a federal government that bought a pipeline, right? Uh, but did that solve our problems? No, it didn't. You know, a pipeline did not solve our problems. We need a better approach, and that a better approach requires better leadership and a respectful dialogue with others across the country, um, and lead them to a, into a different different way of dealing with things. Quebec needs energy too. Ontario needs energy. Lower mainland BC um, needs energy. <laughs> that's right. And we all do. We need it. We need it here. We need winter. We need, we need gas in the winter. We need electricity in the summer. We need, we need all these things to keep our lives going. But we haven't got a very thoughtful uh, Canadian approach to it. And Alberta should be leading it. But by saying, hey, the minute I don't like what you say, I'm just going to close the door. Not going to do it. Like, why would you even want to go there? How many successful teams, if they had a player that just said, well, if I don't get my way, I'm leaving. And that's exactly what uh, the Autonomy for Alberta or the Sovereignty Act says. I don't like the way people are playing in the sandbox, so I'm just going to take all my toys and go home. That's not going to work for us. It's not going to work for Albertans. It's going to be detrimental. We need a better way to do it. And it's, the worst part is the past has shown us the path forward. Again, you know, I... Peter Lougheed, when he was the premier, he had such uh, a respect around the table. He had uh, opportunities to forge ties with with uh, Premier Davis and uh, Bourassa and even uh, Levesque. Through all of that time, Alberta did really well, and so did the rest of the country. Uh, we could get there again, but we need to have a thoughtful conversation about it. Are people talking about it? Are people talking about a... Uh, a more autonomous Alberta, in your opinion, because you're talking to Albertans from uh, Brooks Medicine Hat, from uh, all the way up to Peace River Country, Fort McMurray, all the way down to, and I always forget that Livingstone McLeod, I always forget the name of that, I always think it's McLeod Livingstone. Are people talking about this issue, or are they more worried about the bread and butter issues? And by bread and butter, I mean... How do I pay for gas? How do I get uh, money on my table so I can uh, feed my children? How do I make sure my children have a better education? Are people talking about the autonomy issue? 
Um, I, you know, I, I think that I think that in, in Alberta's place in Confederation, yeah, I think they do talk about it. I think they feel um, disrespected because that's the tone of the conversation. You know, when you don't have a solution, you go and blame somebody else for it. You know, that's that's what that's what our politics have done. We need to get our own house in order so we don't have anybody to blame on that stuff so that we actually do have problems with Ottawa. We can point in that direction and say, you know what, we're doing all we can. We've done this. We've set up these partnerships. We're, we're doing the job of leading ca ca Canadian energy development in a number of areas. We're doing that. So now Ottawa, don't tell us, that, you know, don't tell us that we have to do more than our share. I mean, I talked to a, a group of people and I thought it was a great idea. We often talk about how Alberta doesn't get their share. Ottawa's very, you know, climate change is, is a big thing. It's a really big platform piece for the federal government, uh, except um, right now with the, the uh, you know, the way the carbon tax, the way the, the incentives come to the provinces to fix, you know, to, to invest in uh, climate mitigation strategies, Alberta doesn't get a proportionate share. We get blamed because we're 38% of the emissions of the country or something like that. But do we get 38% of the support to mitigate? No, we don't. See, in that, I would say that's a fairness issue. We want, you want us to be the engine of the energy industry. We do have a lot more of the emissions on a percentage as a province. Then how come we're not getting a requisite percentage of the money to mitigate that? So that's something the Alberta party would look at because that's fair. Um, so I think there's lots of things to do, Chris, that could fix this. But I think Albertans also, for the most part, uh, I think they like being in, like being Canadian. They they they're proud to be Canadians. Uh, do we have a do we have a favorable Alberta government right now? I would say we do not. But at the same time, we haven't really asked them the right questions either. I don't think, and that's because we've got a political surf, uh, purpose being served by making them the enemy. So. I want to turn to more local issues now because you are the Alberta Party candidate in Brooks Medicine Hat. Yep, that's the name of the riding correctly. Um, yep. What are the issues facing the people of Brooks Medicine Hat right now? What are because you're you're not only running to be the next premier of the, the province of Alberta, you're running to be the next MLA for Brooks Medicine Hat. So, what are the issues facing the people of Brooks Medicine Hat right now? Well, I think there's a you know. A, a, We've always felt like we're kind of a bit of the forgotten area of Alberta. The southeastern corner of Alberta is kind of the forgotten area. We're pretty resilient, stand alone, you know, don't bug us too much and we'll be fine. Uh, that being said, however, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think, uh, I think when it comes to municipalities and the areas here, I think, I don't think they've uh, had a requisite amount of support both in, in two areas, primarily the core infrastructure that municipalities need to make sure that they can service their community. I don't think we've got our share uh, overall. And that's why you need to be a, have a better system of budgeting. Shouldn't be political favoritism. It should be priority based. And then the other thing is, is that I, I think from an economic development perspective, I don't think the southeastern corner of the province has gotten their fair share of support uh, from the provincial government. I can think of a couple things in particular when uh, even though it was really great news that uh, there was a, a protein processor uh, setting up uh, just north of us up by Strathmore, there's been a number that have checked uh, into southern Alberta. And because the province isn't competitive with uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, that's where they've moved to. Um, and you only know that when you go down there and say, why aren't we getting these things? And they tell you why. So there's agricultural supports. I don't think that are, uh, we, don't under, we don't listen enough. We don't know enough. So I think those have to be supported from an economic development perspective. And then I think the other things are the service pieces uh, that are a concern in most of rural Alberta, and that's healthcare delivery, education, uh, availability and accessibility. Um, recognizing the differences and sometimes the differences in costs are something we need to really take a hard look at. Uh, you know, there's probably a base number that all, if, you know, if you could have all students gathered in one place, uh, to learn to go from K to 12, you could probably say that's the number. Um, and then, but you know, you've got distance, you've got special needs, you've got demographics to deal with. And again, our area has really interesting demographics. In, the, in my riding alone, we have two separate de demographics. We've got North, North Medicine Hat and Redcliffe, which are uh, 
you know, a little older than Brooks, quite a bit older than Brooks demographically. Certainly not the same makeup. We had a lot more, we got 38, 40% new Canadians here. But yet we have exactly the same tools to deal with healthcare and to deal with education. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you were a layman to look at that and say, well, you know, how do I deal with an age, older community versus younger community? Well, you only get the same stuff. Why well, does it make sense? And so I think, again, recognizing that we're unique uh, and that we need uh, different solutions here is something that I would fight very hard for. You, you mentioned something, and I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. You say you're the forgotten area of the province. It seems like um, that's a big statement to say. Uh, uh, you have had two previous governments, the NDP represented the area, the PCs, or the UCP, I should say, and then the PCs before that. Is this a one-party forgotten corner, or is this both parties that you're talking about, both the NDP yeah, and no. the UCP? Yeah, I, I, I think both. You know, we did have an NDP... Uh, MLA once uh, he ended up being the speaker, and I know that that's a little bit of a different different position, but nonetheless, I I still don't you know having my involvement with the municipality, I I don't know uh, I'm not as up on it uh, with the new administration in Medicine Hat as to what some of their priority areas are, but I certainly know from the last long time that a lot of the areas that uh, the pro the 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 municipalities we're trying to move into or the areas we're trying to move to economic development or those kinds of things. Uh, it was a struggle to get attention down here. It really was. I mean, um, I, it, it, I just, it just always was. Our hospital is a good example. The Medicine Hat Hospital, the maternity clinic shut down is a good example. Um, so how do you know, fix that? Things were important. How do you fix that? Well, again, I, so again, I think you have to move some of this authority and autonomy to local areas. You know, if, 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 if a chronic disease in Medicine Hat is diabetes versus, uh, I don't know, something else, maybe, and, and ours is a high birth rate, say Brooks is, and we do, we have a very high birth rate. You know, should you have the same dollars in diabetes in Brooks as you do in Medicine Hat? Probably not, but we don't really allow that. It's kind of, uh, and we don't allow innovation to happen. I, I, I've li talked to, listen to some doctors speak about some of these things, whether it was the, the uh, conversation around contracts or recruiting. We're not paying enough attention to the local level, to the local situation in order to have better results. And I think the further, quite frankly, even our just our physical distance from Edmonton makes a difference. I think the fact that we've had, you know, opposition MLAs here, uh, I think that we had, a, we had an NDP member who was a speaker. Uh, I can't remember, you know, uh, and I'll, you know, when Lyle Oberg was the, uh, was the PC MLA, I think we were pretty well served, but he was in cabinet. So, you know, uh, it, it does make a difference. It shouldn't, but it does. And I, I think when you talk to people around here, that's the sense I get. We don't want more Edmonton in our lives. We actually would like them to give us a little more control. And that's what I would like to see happen. It's ironic that you would say that after talking about autonomy from Canada and you're saying you want yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, I think, and I think it kind of, it, it you know, we, I think everybody wants, uh, you know, a priority share of what things are going on, but they don't, they don't want it. They don't want it uh, imposed on them. They want to be part of this solution. And uh, I think that goes both levels. I think Alberta needs to be part of the federal solutions and, uh, Medicine Hat and Brooks need to be part of the provincial solution, but uh, they're just not the same all across the board. I, I have one last uh, co topic of conversation, then we'll wrap up here. And it's a very simple one. What's next? <laughs> What's next for yourself? You have a summer coming up here, which I'm assuming if you did not like hamburgers and uh, roast beef, you would uh, dare to not love yeah. them by the time you're done this uh, summer uh, tour. What's the summer hold for yourself, Barry? Well, you know, like I said, we've got a lot going on with uh, getting ready for policy conference in the fall, uh, engaging with Albertans on our citizen-led democracy platforms. Uh, that's going to be a big part of what happens. Um, yeah, you're right. We're going to do uh, go to a lot of communities and and uh, be in some parades and view some parades and go stampeding and go rodeoing and uh, meet people in the street. And we're going to do that all summer long. So there's a lot of that. And, and I'm looking forward to that. I've done that every summer. Uh, president of AUMA for 
not quite as intensely as this, but but I'm I've had good training for it. And I'm looking forward to seeing friends uh, I've met along across the province before. And then, you know, it's uh, things will settle down when the UCP settles on a leader, uh, unless they continue fighting about it after the fact, which is definitely a possibility. But who knows? And then uh, we got an election to get ready for. So you know, we've got a lot of work to do over the summer and hit the ground running uh, again back in September when things start to normalize. But uh, it's just lots of work, lots of fun work, and uh, there's lots of good people out there willing to help me. So I'm I'm pretty excited about the next couple of months. Well, I am too. I'm looking forward to seeing what the Alberta Party has in store for not only the party, but the uh, uh, the province. Um, Barry, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This is always a pleasure to have you sit down and chat. Uh, the hour always seems to fly by. It does not ever feel like we're talking for an hour. But we talked about some very important discussions today. So I want to thank you for doing that. And so short notice as well. Thank you. No, thank you, Chris. Anytime you want to chat, uh, more than willing to step up. Thank awesome. You um, with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. We had a great showing. Uh, for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just get out from behind social media for 15 minutes and go have a conversation with somebody. It does help our society. So with that, talk to you guys later. Mm-hmm.